would turn to Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, Genesis 3. Um, <clears throat> we've, you know, been talking about transgression and we read a, a scripture uh, a little bit ago that uh, spoke of Eve being a transgressor. And, you know, we, so we, since we have her specifically identified as such for Eve, uh, we're going to take a look at her and remembering what we've talked about as far as uh, transgression. Uh, remember, is a stepping beyond boundaries. In other words, a trespass. Uh, that are set by God or by authorities into a jurisdiction that is not my own. It's uh, often a rebellious, specific breaking of covenants with God. And we've talked about how these worries and the fears, the anxieties get in and get, get to us. So again, Genesis chapter 3, please. Genesis chapter 3. And um, we'll start in verse one, and it, it's important. There's a lot that we will see in here when we think about it. Remember, we talked about uh, Eve or, or uh, someone that's in transgression of them speaking a lot. There's a, with with abundance of word. There's there's uh, how does it put it? Transgression is unavoidable. Well, guess what? It's going to be unavoidable. So we'll start in verse one. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which Yahweh God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Um, there's a, quite a, a bit in here that I want us to look at. Um, turn to Genesis. Uh, the Bible right side up. Genesis chapter. Um, Yeah, by the way, let me, let me explain something. Uh, some people will tell you that, and this, of course, is to make you not believe in the, in the Word. They will tell you there's two uh, different creation accounts. Uh, we had someone here a number of years ago that had been told that, and they, that's what they believe. There were two different, and they were shocked when we said, no, there's only one creation account. And in uh, the, the first one is, is broad, and the second one is, much, is very much focused on the creation of man and, and what happened with man. And um, if we look in chapter 2, verse, uh, we'll start in 15. Then Yahweh God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The, the Yahweh God commanded the man saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat from it you shall surely die. Now, let's go back now to Genesis chapter 3 and look at, we'll start at the end of verse 1. Has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. 
But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Now, when we look at verse chapter 2, verse 17, God says, From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. From the day of evil you, you, you shall surely die. Go back over to chapter 3, verse 3. From the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden. Okay, we've got a problem already. Let me explain something. We love to show off what we know. And in areas that we don't know about, we're uncomfortable with them. It's called stretching time and learning time. I'm always amazed people that come here with an attitude of, I know it all, and there's no reason for them to be here if they do. So there's, there's much to be learned uh, from all of us with, in, in life. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God never said that. He said, uh, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Didn't give us an, an explanation of where it was, but he said, that's the one you won't eat from. And then she said, you shall not eat from it. You can just almost hear her. getting. This is the first work of fiction uh, done on the earth, and Eve is all excited about it. You can just see, she's, oh, oh no, wait, wait, wait. I know, we can't be, eat from the one in the middle of the garden, and, and you know, not only can we not eat, we can't touch it. Yeah, wow. Of course, God didn't say that. Now, do you hear what's going on? We have an abundance of words, and what do we have? Transgression. We have Eve saying something that's not true. She's in the presence of not truth, speaking to her, Satan. And she begins to talk about things that she has no idea what she's talking about. One of the reasons that she doesn't, who was given the commandment? Adam. Adam was given the commandment. Um, look in verse 15. Then Yahweh God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And then look at verse 18. Our, uh, let's see. 21. Chapter 2, 21. So Yahweh God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh at that place. Yahweh God fashioned into the woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Now, what do we see here? God gave the commandment in verse, verses 16 and 17, but then later on is when he created Eve. Eve wasn't there. But when Satan comes up, she is suddenly the expert. Well, she should be. Why? I'm connected to the main man. Um, and so she answers the question, which she shouldn't have been talking to a snake anyway, but she answers the question wrongly and adds to it. And we see, now, I, I don't think that this is where she transgressed. I think it's part of it. She's certainly starting to get, get going on it there. But let's go on in, in chapter 3. Um, Satan said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. By the way, there's something I need to stop and say here. This is not the tree of knowing the difference between good and evil. People read it that way, and it's not. The, the word in the uh, Hebrew for knowing or to know, uh, knowing good and evil, is the word yada, and it simply means to know at a very intimate, very deep level. And when it is saying that they would know good and evil, right now, Adam and Eve were com completely innocent. They certainly did not know evil. They didn't know how to do evil. I don't think they were capable of it, except they were tempted to do the one thing. Isn't it interesting? God gave them one commandment, and Satan knew that's where I have to go. Why? Satan always, always goes after the Word. That's why, uh, that's why we're focused on the Word. That is one of the reasons why it's, it's difficult to just pick your Bible up and read it. It's difficult to, to memorize Scripture. It's difficult to do all those things. Now, don't get me wrong. 
God will give you a great hunger and a great enjoyment in the Bible once you've uh, entered into the kingdom with him. But the enemy will still make you struggle with it, possibly do it. Okay, the serpent said to the woman, you'll not die. God knows you're going to eat of it. And then she did. Look at verse 6. And when the woman saw, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes. Now what's interesting is, is those two things are giving us a statement about people. Um, it was she saw that the tree was good for food and of course that you can understand why. They didn't have any other food. They were, Wait, no, maybe that's not true. I think I just transgressed. Um, there, there was plenty to eat. But she, oh, this will be good too. And she saw with her eyes that it was good and that it was a delight to the eyes. Isn't that interesting? Both those things that she saw. And I think where we see right now, remember we talked about in the parable of the sower, in this particular part of it, it was the desires for other things the deceitfulness of riches, okay? These things were, were happening before Eve's eyes. And I, I, I personally think, now just to, so you'll know, the, the issue here was not Eve. It was Adam. Adam had complete um, authority over the earth, certainly did over the Garden of Eden. And the serpent being there, he could have put an end to it. He, literally with just one word. Uh, but he did not. And he let Eve continue to talk to, uh, to a snake. Uh, just to let you know my own particular righteousness, I've never allowed Mrs. Davis to have a long, a long conversation with a snake. I think she talked one time to a little green snake. But it didn't answer back because they're deaf. Um, anyway, but Adam did not stop it and she saw also that the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from the fruit and ate. Now what's interesting is nothing happened there. But then she gave it to her husband and he ate. And it says, verse 7, what's the first word in verse 7? Come on, tell me out loud. Then, then the eyes, then the eyes, then the eyes. It was when Adam ate that their eyes were opened. Okay, verse 5, I want us to look at that just real quickly. Satan is doing something that he's introducing what we talked about, I think it was last, last time, and that is fear. And Satan doesn't care what you fear. He just wants you to make sure you fear. Well, verse 5 says what? God knows that the day you eat of it, you will be, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. Okay? Now, that is, that's a couple of things. Uh, one is that the fear of loss is introduced here. The fear of loss. The fear that you're missing out. Uh, there's something you don't know. And you're going to lose out if you don't know it. That is so strong on us. Some people would just call it curiosity. Uh, curiosity, I think, is something that the Lord gave us, a desire to know about uh, His creation, to know about Him, to know about a lot of different things. But what do we do with it? We transgress. We, we start to know about things we don't need to know. Um, I find it interesting that uh, these creeps that are... Uh, the cross-dressers, the perverts and uh, sexual sin that we have now are going where? To libraries and to the schools. Why? Why are they going there? Uh, it, it's interesting what they're doing, of course, is trying to pervert a little, a little kid that has no idea what any of this is. Um, they can't even spell the word gender. And yet these clowns are going up to them, and I use the word specifically. They've got everything on the makeup except for the red, red nose. Um, and these clowns are going up to these kids, 
and telling them about things they they're clueless in. They're clueless, and uh, this is this is that a kid has no reason to know that. In other words, they're transgressing against these children very much. Um, so there's that fear of loss, and the there's a, a a lie that so many of us believe, and that is I have to know something. That need to know, need to know. Um, that is again the world's media. Uh, the drive to fill oneself with the news, everything that's going on, you've got to know, you know, well, what planet have you been on? Haven't you been listening to the news? And if you don't, well, you know, people, I don't know what they think. It doesn't matter what they think. But we have a real need to know. And then there was another thing that was in this fear of loss that was put in there was a need to have. You need to have this. God's got this. He is holding out on you. He doesn't want you to be like God and doesn't want you to know good and evil. And what we see is the world's media is based on the need to know, but it's also based on the need to have. And it's commercials and advertisement. All of this stuff, these are, are things that... Uh, are simply lies, but we we jump on them, and and Satan will use it to make it think, make us think you have to have these things. All right, Miss Davis, you have anything you want to say on any yeah, of that? Yeah, it's just think, looking at the word. It, well, it goes back to I think it speaks of what it says in First John about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, yes. and the boastful pride of life, because mm-hmm. it seems to be what he hit her with. And it says it's not of the Father, but of the world. And the, um, that's what he appealed to her. But uh, the word, um, the, uh, a delight that was desirable, I think it was the word desirable, I was looking at it. And it's, it's not the same word, obviously. It's the Hebrew word, but in the Greek, in First Peter, it talks about epithemio and the de- strong desire. And that's that this word that's in the Hebrew is a desire, and then it more of the definition, you know, this almost like the words I was trying to look at it, but this a strong, a delight, uh, craving, greed, you know, it's a, a similar word as far as the definition. And um, it's just the, the, our flesh, and he appealed to those things. I, I wonder if, he wasn't watching her. What? Look, <laughs> out of curiosity. I wasn't gonna bring it up, but yeah, I think it was. Yeah, women are curious, you know. Yeah. And I thought, why would he, she say not touch? And I wonder if Adam said, don't touch it either, you know, because women like to touch things, you know. And and I, who knows? But um, just those things that he knew because she was curious, probably. I mean, at least it appeals to appears that way that he could appeal to that. And it does say that it was in the middle of the garden. It says, um, every tree that is pleasing to the side, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So whether that's in the middle, but but it was but it was still, I wonder, you know, adding that don't touch it, you know, it may have been him looking out for her and knowing she is curious, who knows, but, um, I just think the enemy saw something there that he could play on. Little children are curious, you know, the interest in and you know seeing something new and all of that. And you know, I've wondered if he didn't see her looking at it, wondering about it, and he could appeal to her through those things. And anyway, yeah. that's all. I think so. Thank you, Mary. Oh, Appreciate one more thing. Oh, about the, sorry, multitude of words. <laughs> um, the guys that wrote the Man- Jesus Manifesto said the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is from what they studied and was thinking on it. And I thought this is, sounds good to me, but it, it didn't mean it's good. Um, is that it was that you, ha- you can decide what's good and evil from yourself. Basically, our independence here. You can, you can de- decide what's good and evil. And if that's not the lie that we fit into that I can decide I can be God in my life when God said is but two trees there one that's the, the tree of life dependent upon another speaks of the Lord and 
our dependence upon him. And what did he do? You can be independent of God. You can be like God without God. And uh, I just you know, thought of that. I you know, thought of this scenario before and just thought he was offering them. You can be basically like God without God. That's so out there. You can be, you can be good from yourself. You don't need to feed upon the tree of life. You can be independent and happy, wealthy, and wise without God. And anyway, those kind of thoughts from yeah. it. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and I think that, that you know, we are, uh, God designed us, as we brought up before, God designed us to uh, be connected to Him to live mm-hmm. the life. And I think we're, we're going to talk some about that here in just a minute uh, in a, a deeper way. So we're going to leave, leave Eve here and uh, uh, go after Peter. He's the second person we're looking at. I want us to turn to Matthew, turn to Matthew chapter 16, Matthew 16. Okay, Matthew 16, and I want to start, we'll start in verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, who had been beheaded by them, others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah are one of the prophets. And he said to them, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. And he warned the disciples that they should tell no one he was the Christ. Now, folks, we're not going to go into this in depth. But this is pretty heady stuff. This is the Messiah, the Son of God, saying, who do you say that I am? And Peter actually gets it right. Peter Peter comes up and he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, well, Peter, you are blessed because you've got this down. You have, uh, uh, you've heard, I mean, think about it. You've heard directly from my father. Well, that's, oh, wow, <laughs> you know. And, and then he makes him, as the Catholics would tell you, they made, he makes him into the first pope uh, by saying, I'm going to build your Peter, and I'm going to build it upon uh, my church upon you. Now, that's not what it says in the Greek, but that's okay. Um, he says, you're a little rock, but I'm going to build my, my ecclesia on the big rock of my father uh, giving revelation knowledge to people. And then he says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I don't think that he was just talking about Peter there, okay? I think that he was talking about uh, us. This was going to be us. He was in the presence of all. Yeah, he could have been, but I don't believe it so. He said, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What have you bind on earth? And it goes on. And because there's another place that he's not talking to Peter, and he says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Now, the fact is, is that's pretty heady stuff. Now let's go on and read from verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the scribes and chief priests, and from the, I'm sorry, the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Well, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Lord, forbid it. This shall never happen to you. Now, this is. You know, we look at it now and go, Peter, what were you thinking? Well, wait a second. He had just been told, you're the main man. 
I mean, you he he just been blessed, and you're hearing from Father directly. How about that, Pete? And Peter's feeling pretty good about himself, I think. And and he what he does right away is Jesus is saying, "Here's the direction I'm headed." How many years had God been planning this? As far as we know, into eternity. This God had this plan that when man transgressed, that he was going to send his son, Jesus Christ, crucified before the foundation of the world, before time actually began upon this earth, God had this plan. But Peter suddenly knows better. Here's this little pip squeak of a fisherman. And he goes up to the Son of God and begins to rebuke him. God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, I got a new name for you, Pete. Get behind me, Satan. Wow, Peter doesn't know who he is anymore. You are a stumbling block to me, for you're setting your mind on God's interest, not on God's interest, but on man's. Wow. Suddenly he's gone. Now, the reason I wanted to read the first part is to kind of set poor Peter up. He uh, is feeling pretty good about himself. But we're going to look through what we see with Peter is... Uh, in verse 22, this is not going to happen to you, is the fear of loss. The fear of loss. And uh, I want you to turn to Matthew 19 real quick. Turn to 19. Just one verse I want you to read there. Verse 19. Matthew 19, verse 27. 19, verse 27. And this is just to kind of let you see something. Um, Peter is uh, let's go up to 23 uh, this is the, the rich young ruler and he comes he's very rich and uh, verse 23 uh, the, the man has been disappointed with what Jesus said truly I say to you it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven again I say to you it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God when the disciples heard this, they were very astonished. We'll read this in a little bit again. Then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, With people this is impossible. With God all things are possible. Verse 27, Then Peter said to him, We've left everything for you and followed you. What then will there be for us? Now, the reason I even bring that up, we're not going to worry about answering it or whatever, but... Uh, Peter is concerned about fear of loss. He's got that fear of loss, which, which all of us do at, at different times. And so uh, I, with that, we, we've at least begun to see Eve and how she transgressed. And Peter, uh, and we're going to go through and see a lot about Peter in the way that he transgresses also.